And uh, we stopped last Sunday uh, discussion, discussing who was going to suffer the wrath of God according to the scriptures when Jesus returned. And uh, so they were going to begin with Isaiah 25, 1 through 12. Isaiah 25, 1 through 12. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels are whole and faithful and true. Thou hast made of a city a heap of a defense city and ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dead place. Right, right. In what? Dry. In a dry place, okay. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of bad things, a feast of wines on the leaves. And if you don't know what, how many know what the leaves is it talking about there? It's the dread that settled in the bottle uh, of wine as it's aging. In other words, it's the little pieces of seed and peeling and stuff. And it says that is considered the best wine, is the ones that set with that uh, stuff in there. So it says you're going to serve the best wine on the leaf. And uh, of fat things full of mara, of wines on the leaves, well worth really fine. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. And he will save us, this is the Lord, we have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spread forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands, and the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, bring to the ground, even to the dust. Now as we started this study, we told you that the majority, for years and years, and still today, if you turn on your TV and turn to uh, many of those that are teaching prophecy today, you will see that they still hold uh, to the belief that the old Roman Empire Ten nations that were originally in the old Roman Empire is going to be revived in the last days, and the Antichrist is coming from that. I've never bought that uh, for years. I've taught Revelation, uh, but I've never seen it that way because the Bible very plainly in Isaiah tells us that the Antichrist is coming from Assyria. It spells it out just as plain as can be that he's coming from Assyria. And so I had taught all of the time that the Antichrist was going to be in Assyria, but never realized until recently that all the nations around tiny little Israel, on your map there you can see that I circle Israel with a orange uh, pencil there, tiny little nation of Israel there, surrounded to the east and north uh, and uh, south of all the hostile nations. There's Syria, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, all of them. Uh, many of you have attended a funeral 
where uh, it read from Revelation uh, 21 chapter or 21 verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be no more pain. For the former things are passed away. But very few people ever realize that that is a direct quote from uh, Isaiah 25, which we just read you a few moments ago. It's a direct quote from Isaiah 25. In this uh, passage in Isaiah, the Lord is doing more than just wiping away tears and eliminating death. According to Isaiah 25, God will remove Israel's enemies. He will overcome Israel's enemies. And uh, he will swallow up death forever. And he will wipe away all tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people will be taken away from the earth. Now, has that happened? No. Because it is messianic promise. It is to happen in the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is not the Lord's day. The, war, the day of the Lord is when Christ returns to fight the battle of Armageddon, put down the enemies, and begin the millennial reign of a thousand years. And so let's go over to Isaiah 25, uh, verses 8 and 11. 8 to 11. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited for. Now, we've read this just in the beginning, but I want you to get the uh, full meaning here. Let's be glad and rejoice in his salvation, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, which is Zion, which is in Jerusalem, and Moab, who should be trampled in down in his place. Now, see here again, many times, in the last two studies, we've seen Moab mentioned by name that is according to the destruction. And here it says, Moab shall be trampled down in his place as straw is trampled down in a dungeon. He will spread out his hands in the midst of it as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hands. Now, pompous pride, what did I just read you? We will rule the world. So they think. Commenting on this passage here in uh, Isaiah 25, uh, the ancient Latin commentator Jerome wrote of the reactions of God's people. It says, after death has been swallowed up forever, the people of God who had been delivered from the hand of death shall say to the Lord, Lo, this is our God. In other words, Israel will finally realize who the Redeemer is. They will finally accept, the majority of them, will accept Jesus as the Messiah that they failed to recognize the first time He came. But that time has not yet come. God has already swallowed up death and wiped away all tears, of course. I mean, has He done that? Has God already wiped away all tears? No. No. And he has not swallowed up death. No. The context of this passage is in the future. Thank God there's coming a day when our tears will be gone. Our problems will be over. But it is at the return of Jesus Christ. In the coming messianic age, those who enter now, uh, we don't have time to go into this and explain this. Most of you who are been here for the last uh, three and a half years uh, have heard me mention this many times before, that when the millennial reign starts in the thousand year period, there's going to be the glorified saints which come back, who have died, gone heaven, who come back with Christ at that time. They will be in the millennium. And there will be the martyrs uh, that is resurrected that was killed during the tribulation period. But also, there's going to be in that thousand years, those who are still in physical bodies like you and I, 
but they're going to live for a long, long time. They didn't take the mark of the beast. They did. Somehow, they were able to hide and escape the mark of the beast, and they go in to the millennial period in physical bodies like we have, and that's why it says that, you know, there's children born during that time, and it says a child shall die being 100 years old. So they live, uh, God has partially restored what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And these are the people, these that go in to the tribulation, I mean, go into the millennial reign with physical body, are still going to reproduce, have children, and then at the end of that thousand year period, these children that are born, who have never been tested by Satan, it says Satan shall be released for a little season to try those that was in the physical body in the millennial reign. And it says that multitudes of them will fall in. Now how that can be, I just can't understand. After living in a perfect condition, yet they believe the lie of Satan, and then they, together with Satan with the beast, are cast in uh, to the bottomless pit. Um, we who are Christians today have a privilege that we sometimes are stingy with. We're glad God redeemed us. We're glad our sins are forgiven. We're glad for God's blessing, for God's anointing, for God's leading, protection. But how many of us continually, and I don't mean to be obnoxious, I don't, none of us need to be obnoxious, but we all need to be witnesses for Christ. We need to tell people what we have experienced, the joy, the peace, the serenity, the help, and yes, there's tears in his heart because we live in an imperfect world. But we need to tell others there is hope. And too many times we come to church like we have this morning, we sing the songs, we fellowship together, we enjoy God's blessing, and then we go home and go about our business and really fail to minister to people. Now, there's people that carry a big King James Bible everywhere they go, and uh, as soon as they see someone that uh, they think uh, is not a Christian, they'll you know, bust right in like a bull in a china shop and uh, start thumping the Bible and tell them, you know, you've got to accept Christ, you're going to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. Many times, just living a quiet, victorious life Letting people know that you're honest, that you have integrity, you have compassion, you have love, and you're there if they need you. And there's times the Holy Spirit will move upon you and say, share the love of Christ with them. But be led of the Spirit. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, what did he say? You shall receive power. And we think of that power, oh, man, I can whip the devil now, you know, uh, I, I don't have any more problems now, I can just speak to the devil, and put up his tail and run. Uh, but they fail to realize what it says. You shall receive power to be my witnesses. Not to be my warriors, but to be my witnesses. The power is to witness. Okay, that's getting off our leg. <laughs> Those who enter the kingdom as unbelievers will live extraordinarily long life. Now, if you want to read this for yourself, you can go to Isaiah, the 65th chapter, uh, when you get home. Isaiah 65, and you can read about this. But while those who enter as believers will have undergone the first resurrection and now have glorified bodies, we will possess immortality. We'll never die. We'll never wear out. And I, uh, some, I don't know, anyway, in times past, uh, I preached a sermon 
that we were created to last forever. We were. God placed the tree of life in the garden of Eden and placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and man, stupid as he is, chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life. You see, we came with a lifetime guarantee. So what happened to We We gave Satan our guarantee and let him run off with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's uh, read Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Now, this is talking about when the people at the battle of Armageddon, they go into the millennium reign, thousand years, which Christ will rule from Jerusalem. And it says they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who hath part in the first resurrection. But over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. This is the time that all creation has been waiting for. And once again, here at the end of the age, the Lord is portrayed with His hand of blessing upon the nation of Israel uh, and upon the head of Zion, His people, and upon all who have accepted Him as the Messiah. And he is portrayed as resting his foot on the neck of Moab, pushing him into the dumb hill. Once more, we must take note that this is not a vague enemy of God's people that is portrayed. How people can read the scriptures that we read in the last two Sundays through, uh, from Genesis through to Isaiah and Daniel, uh, and Ezekiel, and over and over it says Moab, Egypt, living, Libya, but uh, all of these other nations, and still they teach that the Antichrist is coming and the judgment of God is going to come upon Europe. It just does not make any sense because the scripture builds from Genesis right on through to the book of Revelation, building and giving more information as we go along, that these are the nations, nations. and if you have them out there, then make which one you get, and look where Israel is, and you'll see Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, all, all of these, well, I'm Kadakistan is outside. Uh, any, these are Islamic nations. And Islam says, we're going to rule the world. But I've got news for them. They're not going to rule the world.
Paul, this approach of over allegorization is irresponsible. How much more reckless it is to read Moab and see Europe. Moab is not in Europe. This is precisely, though, precisely what many uh, Antichrist teachers uh, would have us to do, is to believe that he's coming from the European nations. And so once again, according to this passage, at the time of the Lord's return, will the primary recipients of his judgment be from Europe? Or is the text once again pointing to the anti-Semitic sons of the East? Common sense tells us. If we've been reading the scripture and you've listened to what we've said uh, in the first two studies, there's no way we can construe that to mean Europe. Let's go to Obadiah. Uh, well, I don't have a reference, so just Obadiah is, is judgment reward against Edom again. The entire theme of the short uh, prophecy of Obadiah is the victory of the mountain of Zion over the mountains of Edom. Now the mountains of Edom, who was Edom? Esau. Who's Moab? The mountains of Zion over the mountains of Edom. Mountains are a commonly used biblical terms for kingdoms. And while the prophecy had a uh, significant partial historical fulfillment in the ancient conflict between the kingdoms of Israel and Edom, its ultimate fulfillment is in the day of the Lord. Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel uh, rightly states that the final uh, fulfillment of this prophecy and the judgment of Edom will occur during the day of the Lord when God blesses once again when the deliverer is in Zion and the Lord reigns. Also, Dr. Tommy Ice, and he's written a lot about the book of Revelation. I've studied some of his books. Uh, but he uh, addresses the timing of open eyes fulfillment. He says, this passage clearly says it will be fulfilled when the day of the Lord draws near in all nations. And such an event is clearly scheduled uh, to uh, occur at the same time when Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and others indicate the nations will be judged at the end of the tribulation during the campaign of Armageddon. The day of the Lord is also seen in the final verse of the prophecy, uh, Obadiah 1.21, which states that in that day the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion, to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Further evidence for an uh, ultimate fulfillment in the day of the Lord is seen in the fact that the text speaks of prisoners and captives uh, of Israel finding freedom in order to possess, again, the land of Eden, or the land uh, of uh, their uh, ancestor. Uh, Obadiah 1, 17 through 20. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possession. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau a stubble. In other words, what is saying, the house of flame of uh, Jacob and Joseph and the house of Esau is stubble means that they're going to put them. <laughs> they're going to burn them out. Um, they shall burn them and consume them and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau for the Lord has spoken. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of Canaan as far as Zarephath 
the exiles of Jerusalem who are in uh, Shepharah shall possess the cities of the Negevi, I guess. Gilead. Huh? Gilead. Okay, Gilead. Um, I'm reading from the New King James. It says N-E-G-E-B. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Anyway, Gilead, she says. Okay, but since Obadiah's day, Israel has never possessed the land of Edom in any time in history. Now, they fought and they've been enemies, but they've never possessed the land at any time. The only option is to acknowledge that the ultimate fulfilling of this prophecy will take place uh, under the reign of Jesus when he returns. Having established the ultimate day of the Lord, context of the prophecy, then I ask again, who is the prophecy directed against? The prophet Obadiah again tells us that which other Hebrew prophetic prophecies have told us it's against Edom, Moab, Esau, and all the nations to the east of Israel. If uh, Obadiah 1, 8 through 10, and 15, will I not on that day, declare the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom, understanding out of Mount Esau, and your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. You shall be cut off forever, for the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. And as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Now remember that we said in the beginning that the whole Bible is Jerusalem centered, Israel centered. It is a Jewish book, uses Jewish language in many, and that's what we have such a time with in the West trying to interpret the scripture with a Western mind. And uh, we tried to clear that up a little bit uh, in our earlier studies. So in keeping with the Israeli centricity of all biblical prophecy, once again, we see the motivating factor and the basis for God's judgment against Edom, Esau, and Teman is their violent treatment of Israel. God said, don't touch my anointing. The people of Edom, it should be noted, are simply the descendants of Esau who was Jacob's brother. And even before they were born, Esau and Jacob was fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Scripture tells us that. Even in the womb, they were fighting. And they never stopped. <laughs> now, Obadiah used three names here. Edom, Esau, and Teman. But this is, a con again, this is a, a characteristic of ancient Hebrew prophetic poetry. Now, Edom, Esau, and Teman is not three separate entities. It's the same name for one place. They are using synonyms or variants of the same name for the purpose of emphasis. They want you to get it. Instead of saying, uh, you know, uh, that the people of Edom, Edom, Edom <laughs> is going to be destroyed. He says, Edom, Esau, and Teman, I think it was. But the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is that in the context of the day of the Lord, when he executes judgment against the nations, Edom will find its complete and final judgment. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 25. Verses 12 through 17. Pastor, I thought you were going to teach the book of Revelation. We are. As soon as we get the background play. Uh, in Ezekiel 25, 12 through 17, we have yet another clear prophecy of divine judgment 
directed against Edom. This, thus says the Lord God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah, has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them, therefore thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom, cut off from it man and beast, and I will make it desolate from Timon even to Dedan, and Dedan is northern Saudi Arabia. They shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger, according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines. I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the rest of the sea coast. Now, let's look at this. When it says, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, that's the Palestinian territory. The Palestinian territory. And I will cut off the Cherethites, that's Gaza, and destroy the rest of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Once more, what is the specific reason that God destroys these nations? The text is clear. Because of how they treated. The Israelites. For this reason, God will avenge Judah in return uh, with wrathful rebukes. But is the text merely speaking of the region of modern day Jordan? It is much more than that. In fact, it includes uh, the ancient city of Dedan, which is located uh, now in Saudi Arabia and is known as Al Ola today as well as the Palestinian territory. So because the extent of the judgment includes both T Timon in modern day Jordan, Dedan uh, in north central Saudi Arabia, we must take note that according to this, in Ezekiel 25, the Philistines, Edom, Dedan text, God's judgment is directed against the entire region, stretching from Jordan, uh, and you have it on your map of the room right there, stretching from Jordan, southward along the Red Sea, well into north central Saudi Arabia. And the following prophecy we're about to read is no exception. Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 1 through 5. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword shall come upon Egypt, anguish shall be in Gush, when the slain fall in Egypt, and her wealth is carried away, and her foundations are torn down. Gush, which is Sudan, and put, which is Libya, North Africa, and blood, which is Turkey, and all Arabia, and Libya, and the people of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. Now, while these events have seen partial fulfillment in times past in history, the ultimate fulfillment is in the day of the Lord. And he spells that out in all these prophecies. The day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is coming. So, uh, here, as in so many other passages, the Messiah comes to exercise judgment against those nations that have mistreated Israel. Including the list that are marked for judgment are Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Turkey, Arabia, possibly the nation of Jordan after. Once again, this is all in the context of the day of the Lord and Christ's return. Zephaniah 2, verses 2 and 3. 
following in the footsteps of all of the other prophecies uh, that came before him, Zephaniah prophesied that on the day of the Lord's anger, Gaza, Ascalon, Ashdod, Ekron, the Cherethites, the Canaan, uh, and the land of the Philistines will be utterly ruined. Together, these names point us to the whole region of modern-day Israel's southwest coast, including the Gaza Strip. And we wonder why all this turmoil in that area. And he calls in the Assyrian, out of the uh, Assyrian nations, uh, is going to come the one who is going to, he thinks, be the ruler of the world. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and then verses 12 and 13. Seek the Lord, all ye humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on that day of the anger of the Lord. For Gaza shall be deserted, Ashkelon shall become a desolation, Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. And I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. You also, O Cushite, shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the Lord and destroy Assyria. And he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste, like the desert. Now, Raphael Smith, uh, in the World Biblical Commentary, has stated that judgment against Judah and against their neighbors is the major <coughs> emphasis of this section. Philistia in the west, Moab and Ammon on the east, Ethiopia, which is actually Sudan or Egypt, on the south, and Assyria to the north will all experience the judgment of God. It is impossible or it's imperative to note that in the midst of his judgment against Israel's enemies, the Lord will intervene on behalf of Judah and return her captivity. This is yet another important indication that the ultimate emphasis of this prophecy is the return of Jesus after the tribulation period. The inhabitants of modern-day Israel were taken captive then. Uh, during the reign of the Antichrist, only to be delivered when Jesus returns. This is a common theme throughout the eschatological passages uh, in prophecy. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus warned the inhabitants of Judah in no uncertain terms that a time will come for them to flee to the mountains lest they be taken away uh, as prisoners. This is found in Luke 21. 20 through 24. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are out in the country enter in. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. They will fall on the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But despite the warning of Jesus, it is clear that many will not take heed, and they will be taken captive, and uh, Jesus will step down from heaven and he will bring back those that have been taken captive. Many of them will be killed, but he'll bring back those captives that had the flee, bring them back to Israel. Consider the following passage in which the Lord himself comes down to deliver the Jewish people from the surrounding nation. This is found in Ezekiel 39, 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captive, captives 
of Judah and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. When? The day of the Lord. When he comes back and fights the battle of all together. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnants whom the Lord calls for behold in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. This is Joel uh, 2, 32 uh, and 31. Uh, 2, 32 to 31. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion. This is Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. This is speaking about when Christ comes back, brings the captives back into uh, Mount Zion, and uh, they are again to be blessed. Uh, Psalm 102, verses 13 and 19 through 20. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die. Uh, our time... It's about gone. Uh, it's just getting uh, interesting, but uh, we're going to have to stop and take up uh, next Sunday. We'll be